Test five, number eighteen. Dear Miss Hallman, I have received your letter concerning what appeared to be excessively high gas consumption amounts on your previous few months' bills. As a result, I made a special trip to Edmond to discuss this situation with Lucas Fountain, our local manager. At that time, we did two shut-in tests of sufficient duration to show there was no loss of gas in the house line or in the meter. We did, in fact, remove the old meter and replace it with a new one. We also made a comparison study of four homes on your block and discovered that your home did use more gas than the other homes around you. This comparison study showed only that your home used more gas, but did not itemize the reasons for such use. We simply cannot give you a more definitive evaluation than what we have outlined above. We do hope you will continue to remain a yes gas customer and will take care of any outstanding balances on your account. Sincerely, Kate Morris. Number nineteen. I heard what sounded like crying, so I stopped and listened. There it was again, not a cry, a cat's meow. I followed the mews until I found a kitten with spotted fur curled up under a tree in front of a house. It was like finding a present under the Christmas tree. Beaming, I kneeled down and gently stroked its little head, but the kitten's eyes were crusted shut and wouldn't open. I dug through my backpack, found a napkin, dampened it with water from my water bottle, and carefully wiped away the crust. Before long, it opened its eyes, and I smiled because the kitten's eyes were hazel, the same green, blue, brown color eyes as my mom's. How did you get here? I asked as I picked it up and cradled it like a baby. I had been wishing for a cat for months. Was it possible that one of my wishes was finally coming true? I smiled inside and out. Number twenty. I often hear parents saying that they feel guilty because they don't want to play Barbies or Transformers or Spider-Man, etc. You don't have to. We assume that we need to play whatever game our child wants to play. But children also love to be involved in grown-up activities. What seems mundane to us, because we have done it hundreds of times, is still new and exciting to our children. So take the time to involve your children in all the ordinary chores and errands that you have to do, rather than thinking that you need to get those tasks out of the way before you can relax and play with the kids. It's inevitable that involving one of the children in your own tasks will slow you down a bit, but you'll find that it's worth spending the extra time because you are taking care of three important responsibilities at the same time. You're completing the task. You are teaching your child valuable life skills that lead to self-reliance, and you're spending special time with your child. Number twenty-one. A crucial component of teaching effectively with metaphors is clarity. New York Times columnist William Sapphire emphasizes the importance of keeping metaphorical comparisons clear and simple. Mixing the elements, he says, especially mixing cliches, invites ridicule. Sapphire cites language mashups from the 2008 presidential election that stunned voters as well as foreign policy experts. In the metaphor mixer, you hear examples like "that isn't rocket surgery" and "he's cut out of the same mold." Sapphire continues, a radio show host once gave listeners a sinking feeling when he reportedly said. I knew enough to realize that the alligators were in the swamp and that it was time to circle the wagons. Some of us might get the gist of these comparisons because we're familiar with such cliches. Others might stumble on the meaning or miss it entirely because the metaphors are as clumsy as Frankenstein's monster walk. Number twenty-two. 
If nothing else, these examples provide good justification for teachers to fine tune the discordant discourse through intentional and effective metaphorical instruction. Number 22. Social capital's importance to well being cannot be overstated. A striking example of its power, and thus the power of relationships, comes from Finland. Researchers noticed that in one coastal province, the Swedish speaking minority lived longer active lives than the Finnish speaking majority. Although the two communities were similar in most respects, including genetic profile, socio economic status, education, and use of health services, there were remarkable disparities in morbidity, disability, and mortality. Swedish speaking men lived 77.9 years on average, while Finnish speaking men lived an average of only 69.2. The researchers suggest that these dramatic inequalities cannot be explained by conventional health related risk factors. Instead, they point to indications of higher levels of social capital in the Swedish community, including more extensive voluntary associational activity, friendship networks, and religious involvement. Number 23. In 1821, French astronomer Alexis Bouvard published a detailed table describing the orbit of Uranus as it should be according to Newton's laws. However, his observations of the planet soon showed substantial discrepancies with his table's predictions. The irregularities of its orbit suggested a gravitational pull from an eighth, more distant planet. By 1845, two astronomers, Frenchman Urbain Le Verrier and Briton John Couch Adams, were independently using Bouvard's data to calculate where in the sky to look for the eighth planet. Telescopes were trained on the predicted area, and on September 23, 1846, Neptune was discovered within just one degree of where Le Verrier had predicted it would be. Its existence confirmed Bouvard's theory and provided powerful evidence of the universality of Newton's laws. Number 24. The great social psychologist Floyd Henry Allport said, Socialized behavior is the supreme achievement of the cortex. He was right. If you think about this for a moment, you will realize that the social world is our main focus. And it takes up an extraordinary amount of our time and energy. When was the last time that you were not thinking of something social? It shouldn't come as any surprise to you that most of your thinking is social. Why are they doing that? What was she thinking? Does he like me? I owe them a dinner. And on and on. It can drive you crazy. All these social thoughts are reflected in our conversations. Consider all those cell phone conversations that you overhear. Ever hear anyone talking about particle physics or prehistoric stone axes? Social psychologist Nicholas Emler has studied the content of conversations and found that 80 to 90 percent are about specific names and known individuals, that is, social small talk. Number 25. How easily could you give up social media? 2018. The above graph shows the percentage of U.S. social media users in different age groups who said it would be hard to give up or not hard to give up social media in 2018. More than half of all social media users said it would not be hard to give up social media. In each age group, the percentage of users who answered it would be hard to give up was smaller than that of users who said it would not be hard to give up, except for the 18 to 24 age group. Among the 25 to 29 age group, the percentage of users who said it would not be hard to give up social media was one and a half times that of users who said it would be hard to give up.
The percentage of the 25 to 29 age group users who would find it hard to give up social media was lower than that of the 30 to 49 age group users who felt the same. Among the 50 and over age group, the percentage of users who said it would not be hard to give up social media was more than three times that of users who said otherwise. Number 26. James McNeil Whistler was one of the great characters of his era. He painted wonderful works, but was never associated with any particular style of art. Whistler left America as a young man. And lived the rest of his life in Europe. He was born in Massachusetts and spent a large part of his childhood in Russia, where his father worked building a railroad. Whistler's butterfly signature first developed in the 1860s out of his interest in Asian art. One story about Whistler's most famous painting, Whistler's Mother. Tells how he wanted to paint his mother as a standing figure, but she was uncomfortable standing for so long, and so brought in her own chair for the portrait session. Apparently, Whistler went along with her wishes, and a great painting was created. Whistler founded an art school in 1898, but his poor health led to its closure in 1901. He died in London on July seventeenth, nineteen o three, six days after his sixty-ninth birthday. Number twenty-seven. HED wireless headset. HED wireless headset significantly reduces surrounding noise to help you focus on what you want to listen to. Charging the headset. One. Insert the supplied USB connector cable into the USB jack located on the bottom of the right cup of the headset. Two, connect the other end of the cable to a suitable USB power source. Three, the LED will blink red while charging and change to green when complete. Basic operations: one, power and volume. Press and hold the power button for three seconds to power on off the headset. Adjust the volume using your connected device. Two, low battery warning. HED wireless headset will provide a battery low warning sound every twenty minutes when battery voltage is low. Warranty. HED wireless headset. Comes with a one-year warranty from the date of original purchase. Number twenty-eight, volunteer reader recruitment. The Rainbow Volunteer Center is looking for readers willing to donate their time. One of the things we do is to record the news, books, and magazines for the visually impaired, and to distribute the recordings to them through different platforms. How to volunteer to read? To become a volunteer reader, you must pass an audition, which includes a 200-word pronunciation test and several short readings from newspapers and books. Volunteer commitment: We ask for a one-year minimum commitment of one to two hours per week, except for holidays. Age requirement: The minimum age is 20. Many of our listeners prefer adult voices. How to apply? Please fill out and submit the application form by post. Emailed or faxed application forms will not be accepted. You will be contacted within ten days of submitting the application. For more information, call five 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 one zero zero four. Number twenty nine. The natural sciences do not study entities that reflect on their actions and reason about them. Natural scientists and engineers care about where the object falls, the speed at which the chemical reaction occurs, or whether or not the bridge falls down. These realities are observable, and their nature is not clouded by the self-awareness of the objects, chemicals, and bridges. 
we cannot ask the objects, chemicals, or bridges to justify their behavior, even if we want to. The matter of natural science is physical, and scientists can invoke a set of unchanging natural laws that operate on the physical world, acting as causes. The reality that is of interest to natural scientists is external and observable. They can know how close a model is to reality by measuring the behavior of physical things such as rocks, chemicals, and bridges. Number thirty, people tend to acquire rigid habits of perception, and one of the functions of art is to challenge these habits so that things may be seen with a fresh awareness. For instance, the work of Henry Moore. Or Graham Sutherland stimulates an interest in the suggestiveness of shapes, which makes us realize how one object can evoke many different things. Similarly, a study of impressionist paintings makes us more conscious of the infinite variety of color change brought about by the play of light. Another interesting influence on our visual habits comes from photography. In the past. Artists of the naturalistic traditions tended to avoid depicting familiar objects from unfamiliar points of view because this would have been unacceptable to their contemporaries. Since the invention of photography, we have become used to seeing things in unusual light conditions and distorted by foreshortening. On the other hand, the so-called infallibility of the camera. Often leads to the belief that the only true perception of the physical world is in terms of photographic images. Yet a portrait in oils can be a better likeness than a photograph. Number thirty-one, bacteria, like all other living organisms, live to multiply. They will produce offspring as long as conditions allow. And they will adapt their lifestyle to the local conditions that apply, as long as this is within their capabilities. Some bacteria have a very limited repertoire of lifestyle possibilities, so that you always find them living in more or less the same conditions. Whereas others are real universalists and can be detected in a variety of environments. It would be silly to treat bacteria in general terms only, pretending they are all alike. A zebra is not very typical of all animals, especially if it has to serve as an example for insects, worms, and squid, as well as mammals. Likewise, E. coli, which is probably the most generally known bacterial species, is not typical of all bacteria. We can only pay respect to the true nature of bacteria if we recognize their diversity. Number thirty-two. Many scientists report having key insights while engaged in discussion with colleagues, both those working in the same area and those working in radically different spheres of human inquiry. Top scientists realize that scientific creativity depends on conversations, and they do all they can to create more collaborative connections. In the days before the internet, biologist George Klein created a worldwide network of like-minded intellectuals held together with old-fashioned letters and stamps. After decades of such networking, Klein became a clearinghouse of ideas from physicists to poets, passing on letters to others he knew would be interested. The files of his correspondence take up dozens of cabinets near his office. Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine, was inspired to create the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, California, as a forum where diverse interdisciplinary perspectives could come together in everyday hallway discussions. Number thirty-three. Some species of mammals form social groups consisting of many individuals. Within this group, fighting is often limited by forming a dominance hierarchy. Within the group, each pair of individuals will come to a mutual agreement about which will be the boss over the other. This agreement is reached during their initial encounters, 
and determines which individual will back down during future encounters. From then on, when that pair of individuals approaches an item of mutual interest, like food, the higher-ranking individual takes the item and the other moves on. If each encounter instead resulted in the death of one of the group members, then pretty soon there would be no members left, and the species would disappear from the earth. When the members of a species do not fight to the death, then those members are more likely to live long enough to have children. Number 34. Fleeing has been perfected to a fine art, inspiring mythic levels of speed, endurance, and agility in prey species. Plains animals, such as antelopes, gazelles, and zebras, have also learned to measure their attackers' talents against their own. Knowing that lions, leopards, and cheetahs are capable of only short bursts of speed, the hoofed residents rarely panic at the sight of a cat, as long as they have running room and a head start. The important thing is to keep an eye out so the predator doesn't steal the bases and get close enough for a deadly sprint. Against hunting dogs and wolves, however, prey animals know they can't depend on their endurance alone. Canines are not as fast as cats, but they can run for a long time, long enough to exhaust weak, old, or sick prey. Number 35 as a resource, landforms and landform processes can be a natural tourism attraction. One of the most well-known examples of a landform-based natural attraction is the Grand Canyon. But others include Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock in Australia, the Rock of Gibraltar on the Iberian Peninsula, or the Fairy Chimney Rocks at Goreme, Turkey. Cultural values are often attributed to these landforms, and they are visited for that reason. For example, Mount Emei is one of the four sacred Buddhist mountains in China, places where we can safely see the physical, internal forces of landscape formation at work can also become tourism attractions. In particular, Administers at mountain destinations have long had to manage accessibility issues, and it can be a difficult process to extend ground transportation lines to resorts in those areas. Arenal Volcano became one of Costa Rica's most popular sites where tourists witnessed the almost constant effusive eruptions, with ash plumes and lava flow that occurred up until 2010. Number 36. Values and virtues reflect why and how you show up, goals are where you hope to arrive, and virtues are how you get there. When we practice living according to our values, we have a different quality of attention than when we focus on our goals. For example, you may show up in class to learn, value, while you aim to earn a good grade, goal. If your value is learning, you may choose a course that is difficult, and you may not necessarily earn a top grade. If you are goal-oriented and your goal is excellent grades, you might avoid the more difficult class. Your focus shifts, and your choices may shift too. If you value health and your goal is to lose weight, you might not experiment with risky diets. You also may think about health on a larger scale rather than narrowly defining it in terms of your weight goal. You may commit to actions consistent with the larger value of health, such as seeking medical care and facing appointments and tests with willingness. Number 37. Industrialization was one of the key defining phenomena of the modern world. In Britain, the discovery of steam power inspired the invention of numerous new machine tools and production techniques. In turn, those new tools facilitated the manufacture of new consumer machines, 
New materials, cast iron among them, were responsible for dramatic changes in the design of products and the environment, making possible new forms of decoration. Those discoveries transformed the production of the traditional decorative arts. In textile production, for example, the spinning jenny and the jacquard loom revolutionized the ways in which textiles were both conceived and made, requiring designers to make decisions in advance of manufacture, unlike craft workers who had been able to make aesthetic and material choices as they went along. That seemingly simple modification represented an important shift from the working process of the craftsman who depended upon tacit skills to that of the designer who needed to engage in rational planning. It brought with it radical changes in many manufacturing sectors, among them fabric printing, ceramics production. Number 38. Hope of a different sort is found in terms expressing the sentiment that life will somehow unfold as it is supposed to. Consider the Icelandic Petta Redast, which Iceland magazine called the country's motto. Roughly translated as, it will all work out okay, the phrase is commonly used as a rallying cry when outcomes are not especially promising. Many such terms leave the future in the hands of God or destiny. These include the Arabic, insha'Allah, which translates as may God wish it, or the Russian particle, avos, which expresses faith placed in luck or fate. Such terms do not convey assurance per se that a hoped for event will occur. Rather, they assert that outcomes are predetermined, so there may be little point in worrying about them. Indeed, one might decide that any result is for the best, regardless of appearances, that events necessarily reflect some benevolent or at least unfathomable plan. Such beliefs can be a powerful resource, as Nada El Taiba and Maria Harris observed in patients struggling with mental health conditions. Number 39. Psychodynamic therapies, including psychoanalysis, are based on extensive and sophisticated theories about human development, from infancy onward. The infant's development is understood in the context of relationships with others. Psychodynamic therapists have developed methods for increasing awareness of their own and of other people's feelings in order to use the therapeutic relationship to help people to continue to develop. The theories underpinning these therapies were developed while experimental psychology was young, and they have not been amenable to scientific confirmation. Nor has it been easy to assess the effectiveness of the therapies derived from them. Both because they take so long and because their goals are so complex. They have, however, provided therapists with a rich and fruitful source of ideas about emotional development and about relationships. Debates about the extent to which early patterns of relationships determine later functioning continue. But now have to be understood in the context of the proven effectiveness of other forms of psychotherapy. Number 40. A set of cultural worldviews that have been studied extensively is how people approach contradictions. Compared with Westerners, Easterners are more comfortable reconciling seemingly inconsistent claims. Notably, Americans resolve conflicting viewpoints by selecting the one that best represents their view of the world. Conversely, East Asians use a dialectical approach to synthesize propositions and counter propositions that Americans may deem inconsistent. For example, given two contradictory research findings, one more plausible than the other, Pung and Nisbet provided evidence that American participants tended to rate the stronger argument as more plausible when they were presented with both findings than when presented only with the stronger argument. In contrast, Chinese participants tended to rate the weaker argument as being more plausible 
when presented with both findings, indicating that they may have felt obligated to find merit in the weaker argument when presented with both findings. In dealing with apparently opposing arguments, Americans are inclined to choose the argument most relevant to their worldview compared to the Chinese, who are likely to seek compromise. Numbers 41 and 42. Most markets exhibit some form of imperfect or monopolistic competition. There are fewer firms than in a perfectly competitive market, and each can create barriers to some degree. A firm may own a crucial resource, such as an oil well, or it may have an exclusive operating license, which restricts other competitors from entering the business. Operating on economies of scale for a large firm may also have a significant competitive advantage. As it may enjoy a large volume of production at lower costs, which may further lead to the price leadership with low retail prices, such strategy would also prevent potential competitors from entering the business. An incumbent firm may make it hard for a would-be entrant by incurring huge sunk costs with high budget advertising. In view of such strategy. Any new entrant may strive to compete effectively, but may lose the market share if the attempts to compete would fail. The sunk costs are costs that have been incurred and cannot be reversed, such as spending on advertising or researching a product idea. They can be a barrier to entry. If potential entrants would have to incur similar costs, which would not be recoverable if the entry failed, they may be scared off. Another radical strategy may be used by the powerful firms to discourage entry by raising exit costs, for example, by making it an industry norm to hire workers on long-term contracts, which would build the escalated cost barriers for rival companies. Thus, firms can earn some excess profits without a new entrant being able to compete to bring prices down. Numbers forty-three through forty-five. A young man once went to see a wise man to seek his advice. The man was obsessed with worries that endlessly raced around in his head and felt totally out of his control. The wise man walked into his kitchen. Picked up a large glass jar and said, "Come, follow me." They walked through a narrow forest path and reached the banks of a river where waters raced over rocks in a series of rapids. "What do you notice?" asked the wise man. "The river is muddy and dirty," said the young warrior. "It is endlessly racing by, churning over and over." It felt like he was describing his own thoughts. Do you think you can control the turbulent waters? Inquired the wise man. I would have to admit I couldn't," said the man. The wise man handed the younger his glass jar and said, "Here, fill this jar with some water from the river." When he had, the wise man asked, "Do you have control of the water in the jar?" The man replied. I guess I control it, but only this small bit. The wise man smiled and began to walk back to the house with the man following. When they arrived, he asked the man to set the jar on a shelf. Then he asked, "What do you notice? The water is muddy and murky. Good. Keep sitting and quietly watching it for a while." Now that the water was still, the mud began to settle. The water gradually growing clearer, as he kept his focus on the still water, his mind too began to grow calmer and clearer. What are you going to do now? Asked the wise man when he saw the worried man had observed the changes that came through mindfully attending to something. Perhaps I need to take a walk by the river when feeling worried or troubled. Replied the man peacefully. Collect a jar of water. That I can set on a shelf at home and spend time quietly observing it. Ah, commented the wise man. However, 
It is not just the water that has cleared, but also your own mind. You need to practice just quietly sitting and letting your mind clear like the water, even without a jar of muddy water. At this, he nodded quietly and affirmatively.